Alrighty, hello everybody. So we're good to go. Duncan has fired everything up. So I'm Jonathan uh, Baudouin, uh, the Chimera Product Manager. We're doing a webinar today um, for the Chimera 1.4 release, and we'll be going over some of the functionality. Uh, so just in case you ever see me at a conference, now you can put a face to a voice. And uh, so I'm going to shut off my webcam now and get straight to slides. So here we go. So we've just got a few slides prepared. Uh, so like I said, we're just looking at new features and functionality. Um, for the webinar, what we're doing is really focusing on the software. We sell software. We want to show off the software, not PowerPoint. So we're going to go very light on slides and heavily uh, on live demos. Uh, myself, I'm going to be doing the talking and showing and behind the scenes helping out quite a bit is Duncan Mouse, the head of business development, uh, who's joining us from the UK. So he'll be taking your questions in GoToWebinar and collecting them and we'll have pauses here and there to answer them. Um, and of course we can't answer all the questions so he might be uh, filtering some of them for us to, to get the ones that are most interest to most people. Uh, we've made a couple of handouts available versus uh, on the GoToWebinar uh, panel that you've got. There's the release notes for one uh, that came out last week and then there's also a technical paper from 2009 when IVS, which is now part of QPS, first built the first commercial uh, available tools to deal with water column data. So if, if water column is something that's new to you, if you do multi-beam work, it's an interesting technical document that kind of sets the stage of where things were in the industry back in 2009 and some of the early steps that were made in uh, bringing a, a product to the market to let people look at the data and then do things with it. And that's there because we've uh, since done a lot of work in Chimera with this latest release to riff on some of the ideas that are in the first FM midwater product that you've probably been using for quite a while. So that's there as a reference if you like. It's an interesting read. Uh, and if you want to try uh, Chimera out, kick the tires a little bit, you can visit www.qps.nl and click on the download section, the evaluation section. If you're an existing client, just go download it. If you'd like to try it out, go to the evaluation section and there's a form you can fill out. Uh, and someone from the sales team will get in touch with you. Uh, and You'll need your MAC address from your Ethernet card to get up and running if you don't have a dongle already. So what are we looking at today? I'll just go quickly. Uh, we've got some big improvements to how Chimera Live works, and uh, we'll be showing that shortly. Uh, we've got new water column capabilities. So a lot of the ideas that were in FM Midwater have been brought to Chimera uh, with the intent of really dealing with the hydrographic, uh, the cartographic market, looking at hard targets in the water column, for example, picking the top of a mast. Um, if you've got FM Midwater already in your license holdings, this will just work for you if you've got Chimera. If you don't have FM Midwater and you have Chimera, you can get in touch with the sales team about getting the add-on. Uh, we've got quite a couple of features for the uh, North American hydrographic charting market, uh, particularly of interest to the NOAA uh, charting folks and then the people that do mapping for NOAA, a lot of the contractors. So we've got the Takari Tide Engine integrated and a lot of the NOAA Cube presets are now, now available. Um, and from a our Quincy users who uh, are part of our QPS seamless workflow, that's the upstream acquisition side of Chimera. Um, we are now supporting single beam from uh, Quincy and now you can apply Tide aspect navigation uh, and also you can uh, write your patch test results back to the Quincy, Quincy template DB so you can speed up your back to work time uh, when you're in the field and you have a patch test result in hand. And then with our colleagues at Collinsburg we've added support for the NavLab format uh, which is uh, post-processing navigation software that primarily de deals with uh, subsea platforms so you can smooth things and integrate all the different sensors to come up with a, a smooth, uh, inertially smooth uh, solution. So there's a lot of other features. I'm just going to quickly spin these up here. We're not going to really touch on these today in the webinar. They're written up in the release notes. There's a couple of screen grabs. If you're curious, go have a peek. Uh, but really we'll leave that there and end the few slides that I promise would be short. And we'll get straight, straight to demo now. So what we'll start with uh, Chimera Live. Uh, what Chimera Live is, we've released this about a year ago, but really haven't had a good chance to really play it up. Uh, what it lets you do is run Chimera in an onboard situation where you're sitting next to a surveyor who's acquiring data. And you can basically have Chimera watching for incoming data files. What I'll do is I'll get things started by bringing one file in. And I've got a collaborator in the office next to me, James Mugga, who is a friend and colleague of mine from my days at UMB, who works with us now. And 
he is going to be copying files into a shared Dropbox folder that he and I share. So they're going to bounce off to the internet and then from his machine next door down to my machine and we'll basically be simulating what this would be like on our ship in real time. So what we'll be doing is showing off some of the new capabilities with this release that make Chimera Live much more attractive to a lot of our clients. You can now play around with the configuration of your vessel. For example, I'll change the pitch offsets a little bit here. I'm just typing in some silly numbers for an example. Maybe I'll change the TPU parameters. A one degree transmit beam, 0 0.5 degree receive beam, and let's just dial in a 75 microsecond pulse width for the TPU calculations. So I'm just basically making some silly, silly changes to the vessel configuration. And that, that affects this file. What I'm going to do is save this as a template for reuse. And that's going to park it in my vessel directory. And now I've got it, if I hit control F and I go to the vessel directory, there's a configuration file that you can apply for manual import or with Chimera Live. So let's let this file finish processing because I've changed the vessel configuration. And I'll add it to a new dynamic surface. I'll make a 50 centimeter grid cell. And there we go. So there's the first line that comes in. So imagine I'm a surveyor and the first line has come in and now I just want to sit back and let Chimera Live do all the working. So I launched this dialog. Actually, let me move this out of the way so we can see it. I specify what folder do I want Chimera Live to start paying attention to. So this is just a Windows Explorer. I, I select this folder, and this is where James will start copying files into very shortly. I specify how often I want to check. I specify if I want to copy that raw file into my project after it's, uh, after it's aware of it. What dynamic surface do I want to add that to? What vessel does this belong to? And then here's where I specify that overriding vessel template right here. That's what I when I made the silly changes and saved it to a file. Now I get to specify that. And that comes in. And it's telling me, hey, you brought in a file already that's not encapsulated in your project. Do you want to bring it in? I'm saying, sure, why not? So that's going to copy in. And Chimera Live is running. This button is pinned down. And there's a little cycling icon you can see moving, spinning around. And also the sign is if you come down here to the bottom, it says auto import is on. And the tooltip shows you the directory that it's monitoring. And this just gets to work. So what I'll do is tune this a little bit. I'll color by the surface by standard deviation because I want to keep an eye on that in real time to see the overlap between my files and see if that's not, if it's acceptable or not. And I'll change the color map uh, to the midwater color map, which is nice. We pointed out in our last webinar for showing off where things get big and ugly and nice and calm blue when things are okay. So any minute now, James should have some files coming in for us. So what we'll do is we'll leave this running throughout the course of the webinar, and we'll see this just slowly growing as each line comes in. Oh, there's the first notification from Dropbox. So James has copied that file over. And Chimera will wake up and see that shortly, and it'll get added to the project. So what I'll do is just minimize this and get on with the task of the other stuff we want to show off. So I'll run Chimera a second time, and we'll just start a new project where we start looking at some of the water column capability. Uh, first, we'll look at rec investigation. If you're doing charting work and you want to find the shoalest depth over a wreck, uh, you can use water column data for that. In case the multi beam had a hard time picking up the shallowest depth for the wreck. So I'll add my files. And they come in quick, 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 as is usual, telling me that the vessel offsets are zero. I know that. That's by design, and I'm okay with that. I'm going to tell it, don't tell me that again. I don't want to edit that. And now it prompts me the dynamic workflow to make a dynamic surface. I say, yes, I'd like to create a new one. Uh, 50 centimeters is the suggested cell size. I agree with that. And what I'll do is enable cube processing. And if I want, I can come in here and 50 centimeter. I'm going to use the NOAA presets for 50 centimeters here. And this sets these accordingly. I click OK and I click Go. So the .all file came in, it got converted, and TPU was calculated, and all that good stuff, and boom, straight to a cube surface in a couple of seconds. So now I'm here, I need to do the job of looking at a wreck. So let's uh, tip this on the side, go to 3D view, 
and we can see that the wreck was largely captured. There's something interesting going on off to the left. Um, and if we go into the swath editing mode, what we had with, since we shipped Chimera uh, 18 months ago was the ability to look at water column data. So that ability is still there, and what we've done is added the ability to do some extra cool stuff with it. So I'm just going to tune my swath editor a little bit for this job. I'm going to increase the ping buffer. I'm going to color my swath edit points by intensity. And I'm going to color them the exact same in the scene. I'm going to match the plot color in the scene. So now I'm seeing color by intensity there. So if I come over to the scene and I hold down shift and left click, I can drag this around and reposition it to the view I want. I want to get looking from behind. There's the survey line going off into the screen. Um, and one more thing here, I want to have my above view. So this is the above view of the swath editing, and then the one above that is the behind view. So all of these views let me get straight to work. And now what we can do is start going through the data to see if we can find a mast. And so I can do that with the mouse and the above view, and the water column view updates, and I can see there's the mast. If I come over to the water column view, I can use the A and the D key to step back and forth a ping at a time. And you'll see that the swath edit view and the map view all update with the current ping. So they're all time synchronized. So what I'm going to do is quickly pass through these four, five, six files and show off a neat new way to do this. So I've found this. This is probably the best image of the mast I can see. There's a new button here, Save Fan Snapshot. And what does that do? Click it. And this view gets dropped in the scene. So it's kind of like you're in Flader Mouse and you took a shortcut from Midwater straight to Flader Mouse and you've got a fan dropped right in the scene. That's kind of neat. How's that useful? Well, what I can do is quickly spin through my files. And I, again, I hold down Shift and click, and I spin it around to get my behind view. And I start scrubbing through my swath editor here to figure out where do I image the mast. And because I've got the scene integrated, I can, t I can tell that I'm not going to have a really good imaging of that mast from this particular pass. But what we'll do is... Uh, Oh, James just got a new file in for me. Let's uh, pop over to Chimera Live. Oh, sure enough, yeah, it's just cooking in the background. That surface is growing. I've got three files in now. We started off with one. We've got three. Oh, there comes another one. Okay, so back to the water column work. Uh, I can see in this view that there really isn't a good imaging of the mast at all as I scan back and forth. So I'll skip this line, go to the third line, and again, I go to the scene, I hold down shift and left click and just spin this around so I get the behind view so that, so that mentally I don't have to be flipping my left and right. I'm looking in the same direction down here as I am here. So with this pass, I would expect that we would have imaged the mask for sure based on that first snapshot that we saved. So if I scrub along in time in my swath editor, oh, there's the mask there. Sure, I see it and I use the A and the D key to narrow in where I want to be. That's probably the best shot there. So we're going to save another snapshot. And we'll go to the, the next file. Zoom out a bit, shift, and left click, drag to spin that around where I want to be looking from. And then I do the same job. I scrub along in the swath editor, and I find where the mast is. And it's just off the left edge, the port side. And you can see that the sonar tracked it a little bit here on some pings, but not all. So that's probably the best one there. I'll save another snapshot. Jump to the second last line. So this one's running down the long axis. So again, sh shift, left click and drag to change my view. Now these fans are getting in the way. I'm going to turn them off for a minute here. I just turn off that and they're just not drawn. And again, I can see really clearly in the backscatter image, in the swath editor, where that mast is. And the A and the D key let me advance back and forth a couple of pings. And another snapshot into the scene. That's probably the best one so far. And then the last pass. And this is typically how people image wrecks when they really care about finding the shoalless depth. You get a bunch of passes. It's hard to tell if you got it in real time because it's going by at 10 or 15 or 20 hertz in front of you on the sonar display. So you get a bunch of passes and then you have to review them quickly to figure out, did I image that? So in the field, you can see this workflow being very handy and helping you figure out, did I get the job done or not? So here I've got that. You can see that the sonar soundings tracked up the mast for a little bit, and then there's a line actually going to a buoy that it tracked. 
So I'll take another snapshot there. So I've done my first pass. I'm going to turn these all on again and come over here and zoom in a bit. And let's figure out which one had the best one. So if I select all of these, we can use my favorite mode in Chimera, which is flicker mode. And that's the tilde key. And I can cycle through them and figure out which one of those is the best one that captured the entire mast, including the top one. And if you look at it, it's line number eight has the best imaging of it. So what we'll do is, okay, let's get to the business of picking an extra sounding. Switch to line number eight. And I'll turn these off in the view. Scrub along again. I'll find that ping. It's right about there. Okay, so now for the fun parts, the math, there's a new button here. It says add sounding. I click that and, oh, one more thing. There's a feature that when I, we're calling these user picks. The user has picked a sounding. When a user picks a sounding, we would, if you would like to set it the feature flag, which you can use in the rest of our workflow, you can do that here. So under the context menu, there's an option to set user picks as features. So now when I click this, I'm making a sounding. It's just a little tiny. I'm going to increase the dot size. So you see that magenta dot right on the top of the mast. Save that. Oh, and Dropbox is telling me that James has another file in there. Let's just have a quick peek. And sure enough, that's growing quietly in the background. So imagine sitting offshore and this is just growing in front of you. Um, so there, I've done the job of picking that sounding. I've done my hydrographic charting work. We leave the swath editor. Oh, but before we do, what I'll do is get a stacked fan, turn off the soundings, and I've got an image where we've, we've collapsed all of the ping data that's in the current ping buffer into one image. And what I can do is make a snapshot of that. That goes in the scene. And I can save that as an image on disk, fan view. And I can save that for my report, for example, to, to demonstrate that we did indeed image the entire mast. And that saves. I can also save, uh, sorry, not save. You can show a side view now, which we didn't have in the previous version of Chimera. And so that's a stack of everything looking from the side. And there's a bit of green fluff up here, and that's just side lobe interference. So we'll apply some side lobe suppression. This is something that came straight from midwater. Uh, so that should clean up the green fluff in this view. We should get a much better contrast image between the water and the wreck. And we can save a side snapshot, a snapshot as well to the scene. There you go. And you can also save that, save a side image for your report. And if you hit Control F in Chimera, you can always get to your project directory. And there are the two images I just exported. So there's one, and there's the other. And these are not refraction corrected, but they're good for just providing the evidence that you did indeed image what you thought you wanted to. Okay, so let's get out of the swath editor. Our job's done there. You can see now that this file needs reprocessing. It's because we've added new soundings. So let's do that. We reprocess it. And let's just turn these objects off. They're kind of in the way now. They've served the purpose. And we've reprocessed it in the dynamic surface updated, but we don't see a mast there. And that's because we made a, a cube dynamic surface. And uh, it didn't it did the right thing and it picked the soundings down here because there's much more of them. So what we can do is convince Cube to create hypotheses from features. When I set the option in the swath editor, it marked the feature that I add, sorry, the sounding that I added as a feature. And now in our workflow, you can have this, turn that into a custom hypothesis. So now you'll see that the mast, the top of it is picked up there. And of course, the grid responds to that. And if I circle this, I could go to the 3D editor and launch this, and we can see all the points that we've got. Let's hide them. So this green dot is marked up as the user added sounding, and if I switch to cube editing mode and zoom in, you'll see that there's a custom hypothesis for that as well. Oopsie. little orange square. So Cube, well, we forced Cube to lock onto that sounding. And I just realized now that I forgot to add the tide to this. So let's do that real quick. 
I'm going to add a tide file. And it's detecting the format for me. And I'll just give it a station name and bring that in. And so that comes in. If I look at the time series editor, that looks like tied to me. And that lines up with all my files. You can see that they've all been marked as needing reprocessing with the, uh, the update icon. And if I select them all or let the dynamic workflow let me get to where I need to be, I click yes. And the tides applied. The whole surface shifts. And if I run the 3D editor again, we'll find that the cube hypothesis shifted along with it. And there you go. You're done. That is a wreck investigation in Chimera using the new water column tools. A couple of questions, JB. Sure. Uh, first question uh, was, is it possible to do user picks in the curtain and the side view? Yes, it is. Actually, I'll jump to the next demo. Uh, I'll start that up. OK, whilst you're, whilst you're that. doing that one, then the next question was, uh, side lobes work only with .org files, or do they work with DB files as well? The side lobes. All files. And anything that shows up in the water column widget, you can use that. So yes, I said all files. I meant every kind of file that you can bring to Chimera that lets you do water column. So here's another example of how you might use this. This uh, is some old data collected off the east coast of the US um, at an aquaculture site. And you can see that the bathymetry, the, the, the multi-beam picked up some, fe some interesting features here. And if I run the 3D editor for that area, oh, embarrassing live crash bring that up again. If I do this and run the 3D editor, I can see that it's picked up. It's managed to track some objects in the water column that look interesting. There's a lot of fluff and some structures up here. And what we'll do is look at the water column data for that area as well. So again, we'll use the swath editor to get access to the ping by ping count. Um, the water column and I'll get the above view going again and a color by intensity. So what I'll do is the, that person had asked a question, the stacked fan lets us stack data and I'll turn off the sounding overlay and I'll jump right to here. I'm going to shorten this demo up a bit because I think I'm going to run out of time. You can see a bunch of structures here uh, and if I switch quickly just to the single ping fan you're getting, that's one fan of this whole ping buffer of maybe 100 or so pings. The stack puts them all together and it's a shine through principle. The strongest one wins. What you can do is clip the low end of the histogram like you do in the in FM Midwater. Click OK. And now, so you could do this before in FM Midwater, but not a lot of people knew about it. There was a stack view but what you could not do is select soundings in there. And it gives me a nice little warning that says, you're going to pick a whole bunch of new soundings. Is that OK? And I say, yes. Don't tell me this again. I know what I'm doing. And so it'll think about that. And then those are all my extra picks. And if I turn on the side view, it has the same display characteristics. It responds to the histogram settings. And you can see the things that I chose in that view are, are drawn here as well. So I've got that, the two different views to give me the context. And if I advance the ping buffer, I can just finish the job. And I'll show an example of picking in this scene here, where I'll pick the rest of this. And it thinks about it. It has to spin through all of the pings and all the water column data. So what I'll do is hit Save. And I won't go through all three files. I'll just let this file reprocess. And the grid will update with all of that extra information. And it's a little strange to think of it as a grid. A grids are great at showing the seafloor, but not seafloor and structure. So the grid looks a little odd, but what we can do is lasso this and then go to the 3D editor. And you can see all of those extra points that I picked relative to the, what the sonar saw in orange here in the middle. All of the green circles are ones that I chose. And I can change that down here. Let's draw them as diamonds, for example. 
uh, color them by intensity if I like. So you can use these tools to pick out water column infrastructure, whether it's cabling or moorings or whatever. In this case, it's a fish pen suspended in the water with just a little bit more than neutrally buoyant to keep it afloat. So that, I think, answers that question that a particular uh, attendee had. And what I'll do is show one more application of um, midwater capabilities. So I'll make a new project. And this is some data we got from a colleague of mine, Garrett Mitchell with Fugro, who collected some engineering data before a cruise a little while ago. Uh, so they do a lot of uh, hydrocarbon exploration and sea punting. And this is typically something that's done in our FM midwater tool. Uh, we didn't set out to replace that capability with this. But there's a lot of interesting ideas in here that make things maybe easier if you have certain demands on midwater uh, for a workflow. You might want to come and kick the tires on this in Chimera. So I'll create a grid. And again, I'll go to the swath editor. And I know for a fact that the seeps are somewhere around here. And because I have the, sing the stacked fan going, I'll see all of those seeps. So I'll turn off the sounding overlay and I'll threshold the display a little bit just to get the seeps. There we go. So this is a stack view. I'm seeing several pings at a time. In fact, let's just turn that up to full and it'll restack them. And I'll go back to lasso selection mode and I'll just make this a little bit bigger so people can see what I'm up to. There are some seeps here. Well, they look like seeps, so let's just call them seeps. And I can select all these, and I'll get just everything before the nadir ring, which is the big circle of silo interference that you get when you have the first return. And I'll grab this little loner over here. And there we go. And whenever you grab new things, it turns on the sounding display for you again. I don't want to look at the, the sonar's detections. I just want to see my own. So I can hit save. And I can get out of the swath editor. The file mark is marked as needing reprocessing. I click go. And this is going to add these bubbles, these seep structures, to my terrain model, which doesn't make a lot of sense. You're averaging the, the, the ground and the seep. So the average of that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But because it's included in the surface, I can go in now and launch the 3D editor. So on this surface, launch the 3D editor. And I can see all the seeps there. And what's nice that you can do in Chimera that was really difficult to do before, let's turn them into little green balls again. Or whatever, balls. I can edit these points. They're just like soundings now. Oops, clear. I'm going to circle these and hit the D key to delete. Uh, there's a bunch of junk that I accidentally selected down here. I'm going to delete these, and there's a little bit more here that I'm not interested in. Let's get rid of that. Delete that. And that's good enough for the sake of this webinar. And what I'll do is save and exit. So that updates the grid. It's still a bit of a silly grid. What I'll do is I'll make a second one, and it's going to warn me about making another second surface. What I'll do is turn off this, this here. I don't want to include my additional picks. I just want plain old sonar detections in my grid. And that just may be a baby little grid there. And now what's neat is I can grab this file and go to the export menu. Under raw sonar file, there's a couple of new options. I can export to SD points now, or SD cluster, if you want to do cluster analysis in Flater Mouse. I click SD points. And I don't want the sonar's real-time detections. I want the ones that I detected. And I want to load that to the scene. I click OK. And I can give this a name, plume. And this gets added here, first of all, to the scene, just like that. So there they are, and it's added as an SD object. I can increase the point size for a better visibility. I can change the coloring by intensity. And if that's good enough for me, I could save this whole thing as a flatter mouse scene and include my track lines, my surfaces, grids, and SD objects, and off I go to Flatermouse. If I want to do AUV mission planning, for example, or, or cluster analysis, that's ready to be worked with in Flatermouse right there. 
So that's the end of the um, water column demonstrations. Let's just have a quick peek at Chimera Live here and see what's going on. We have 12 files in now, uh, so that's good, happily chugging along. If I wanted to, I could be sitting here and cleaning data while that was happening, uh, but I'm not. But that's something you could do with Chimera Live. Um, any questions, Duncan? Yeah, one quick question um, uh, about the user picks. Uh, does that mean that they will be sound velocity corrected? Yes. The nice thing about the tech that we had in Midwater coming to Chimera is we have the full Quincy geo-registration and geo-referencing and ray tracing engine that's in Chimera that makes Chimera possible, that we just basically have a new kind of sounding that we drop into the mathematical hopper to do all of the math. So they get the exact same treatment as a regular sounding. The TPU is computed. If you have tied, it's applied like that. So when, once it's created, it's treated exactly the same. So there's Chimera Live still running in the background, uh, adding files quietly away. And the nice thing about this is if I shut this down at the end of the day and walk off the boat, this whole project's ready to go. It's got all my data. It's got any preliminary grids. If I did any cleaning to it while it was working, that would be preserved as well. All right, so let's, uh, let's switch to the second half of the demo. So I'll run Chimera again, and I'm just going to clean up my desktop a little bit. Uh, and we're jumping to Takari. So Takari is, stands for Tidal Constituent Residual Interpolator. This is a tidal engine that takes tidal constituents and residuals between observed and predicted um, tides and propagates that through a spatial uh, meshing algorithm. And this is something that NOAA in the, in the U.S. has developed to uh, allow them to have a, a sophisticated way to compute tides in, in areas where there's a lot of tide stations and they want to spatially spread that around. So what I'll do is I'll bring in the, uh, the data for this. So I've got a fake multi-beam file that I had to generate to fit within the area of the Takari model that we were provided with. This has a wreck in it, just because wrecks are cool, but I need to point out that there is no wreck at the location <laughs> where we are doing this. So I'm creating, creating a dynamic surface. It's a one meter grid, suggested I agree. And because it's NOAA work, I'm going to say yes, let's do cube. We'll use the NOAA presets of one meter. Okay, and off we go. There's my dynamic surface. Let's have a tip in 3D and have a look at it. And there's a wreck, kind of interesting. Uh, so I'll switch back to plan view. And now what you can do with Takari. So this is the new stuff. Under the source menu, you go to add, add tide files as you always have before. And now it will recognize .tc files, which is the format that the NOAA field units and their contractors are given when they're supposed to use Takari. So I, I point at the TC file, and it brings it into the, process, into the project. And there's a dialog after it's parsed the information. I just click OK. And it's identified four tide stations. If I zoom out, I've got the black background. But you'll see there are four yellow dots where those tide stations are. If I go to the scene menu, I can show the background chart in the 2D view. These are just the global ENCs that we ship to give you some context of where you are in the world. And so I've got that, that QA. I, I see that I'm in the Chesapeake Bay area the, near the mouth, and the tide stations from the TC file land on spots which make a lot of sense. So I get that double check. Okay, yeah, I probably brought in the right thing. I'll turn off the chart view and get right back to my multi-beam file. So how do you use this? I click on my multi-beam file, and under the Tools menu, under Manual Processing and Takari, there's a new option. You can download the Takari tides. So we've integrated the Takari engine in that we're running it behind the scenes under the hood for you. I'm going to choose Predicted Tides, and so that's going to download now. So it looks at the time span for the data, and you can see that the project has now added tide data. If I go to the Time Series Editor, there's the tide for that time span. How do I use it? I, I select my multi-beam, I go to Tools, Manual Processing, Takari, and I compute Takari tides. And what that does is it takes the spatial location of each ping and it looks up in the, the, the mesh model. I'm going to choose Predicted. So this is computing the tide for this file. And what it does is it injects that as time series data. So if I click on the multi-beam file and I look at the tide in the combo box in the time series editor, 
I come over here, we see all the sources of Tide available. The one at the top is the one that's going to be used. This is a priority list. So the Takari with the fake multi-beam file, that's ready to go. And this file is marked as needing reprocessing because we brought Tide in. So if I click Update, we'll see that the surface shifts ever so slightly. Um, okay, so we just applied predicted Takari Tides. Let's say you do all of your work in the field and you're done, and then someone at the office tells you that the verified tides are available. What do you do then? You just grab your files, go to the Tools menu, Manual Processing, Takari, download it again. But this time, instead of choosing Predicted, I choose Verified. And I click OK. And that downloads. So the Takari engine that we're running underneath the hood is talking to the Internet and getting to a server and using the, the infrastructure that's already in place with the NOAA PIDRO tools to get access to that data. And I'll select the file again, and now I now that I've downloaded the tide for each station, compute the Takari tide for the time and location of my vessel, I choose verified. So at the end, when I'm ready to do my final tides, I would do this. And that computes, and the file needs processing, and it's telling me, would you like to update? Yes, of course I would. And it updates the grid. And that's all done. So that's Takari, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. So if there's any NOAA folks or NOAA contractors have any questions, now's a good time. No one's... One other thing that's interesting. Oh, Duncan, you got a question? Yeah, no, no, no one's answer, answering your question yet. Okay, so uh, also how can you keep track of everything that's come down? If I click on the Takari item in the Strategies menu for under the Tides, you'll see that you can see all of the verified and predicted for each station. And you'll see some are nice and smooth. Those are predicted. And the ones that are a little wobbly, you know, capturing the meteorological effects, those are obviously the verified Tides. All right, so let's jump to the next one, Takari Single Beam from Quincy. So if you use our acquisition system, uh, Quincy, you can get very easily into Chimera and get straight to work. So I've got some data that was uh, kindly provided by the Royal Netherlands Navy, uh, and they run multi-beam and single beam at the same time in Chimera. And it looks like Chimera Live is still running here. We've got 16 files. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll run Chimera again, and when this comes up, if you're a Quincy user, this is what you do. You come to Chimera and so say, I would like to open another project, an existing one, and you point it to your Quincy project. And there it is, Royal Netherlands Navy. And if you're a Quincy user, you'll recognize all of these directories. And you just say select folder. And Chimera recognizes it for what it is. It's a Quincy project. And it says, would you like to just do point cleaning or sonar processing? I'll say just point cleaning. It warns me that, oh, you've got multiple vessels. Uh, you need to do full sonar processing. And I'll say, yes, OK, that's fine. Um, and there we go. There's the file that comes in. It's found the QPD, so the real-time computations from Quincy are stored, so the results reach soundings. And the grid that was computed in Quincy is brought into the project as well with basically a click. And what I'll do is I'll just update the shading to reflect something that looks a little nicer in Chimera. I'll adjust the color map range to about there. Click OK. And I can see some, some really nice sand waves here. And what I'll do is grab a little slice of data here just at Nader. So again, we're showing off for Quincy users that have single beam and multi beam running simultaneously. Uh, this is now supported in Chimera. Before this, you could only do point cleaning. So I've got this area selected, and I'll run the slice editor. And it's picking up some of the goofy soundings. So it's setting the Z, the Z range. I'm going to zoom in here and increase the dot size. So I can see what's going on, and I'll change the color by to be color by system. And now I can see there's a red and green high density data. That's the multi beam. This is a dual head system they have. And then these other dots are the single beam that are running. And so if you go to this far right button, the show sounding properties, this lamp launches a dialog. And what I can do now is as I mouse over soundings, it updates this dialog. And if you look in the central section here where it says system, that tells you which systems it's from. So you can tell this is from the multi-beam Equisender MBES SIMAD EM3002 port. If I click on this button, I can force it to choose one sounding. So I click there, left click, and we can see if I look at the system lists, single-beam Equisender SIMAD EA.
600, 200 kilohertz. And this other color dot, the yellow, is the 38 kilohertz. So they're running two single beams simultaneously. Um, we can see that in the slice editor. So of course, with Chimera before, you could bring this, these in as points and you could kill dots if you like um, or not. So what I'll do is get out of the slice editor and show that you can actually do extra things now. Oh, I put a nice little hole in my terrain model there. Um, I can add tide files now. Okay, that's detecting the format. And again, I just give it a station name, my station. And I click OK. And the tide is imported. Let's just go verify that time series editor. I click on the tide file. And I can see this does indeed look like tides. And this is uh, in the North Sea, this, uh, near some amphidromic points. So there's some interesting tides going on there. Um, and it's lined it up with that particular multi-beam file. It says, hey, you need to be reprocessed because tide came in. And I line up with you in time. So if we reprocess this, we'll see that that all updates. And if I grab that slice again, and I go to the slice editor, I could see that all of the soundings updated. The single beam and the multi-beam all came along for the ride. So this is new capability. The single beam points have been adjusted for tide along with the multi-beam. Before, we just didn't do anything with the single beam points, points at all. So that's new capability for Quincy users. Uh, what is also new is I'll just do something, another silly example. If I grab this file, I go to the patch test tool. I'm not doing a patch test, but I just want to quickly show off some capability. Let's say I wanted to adjust the pitch offset by a tenth of a degree for the port head and the starboard head. I hit memory plus. These are saved down here in the lower section in the cumulative offsets. I would save and apply this. This is the usual patch test workflow in Chimera. I save that file and I would choose this to apply to. And now there's a new tick box down here. So this is for Quincy users. You can apply these results to the Quincy template DB files. If you tick that box, the template DB file that's in that project where the DBs live will be updated. So you can go back online and get straight back to work. We basically push those into the real-time environment for you. And I'm not going to bother reprocessing that. It's just for example. But if I hit Control F to go to my Chimera project directory, and I go to my database directory, there's the template DB file that Quincy users know. And if I look at the timestamp on that, that's one minute ago. So this file is now ready to go. If you go back online in Quincy, every new line you collect now has the new patch test offsets baked right into it. So that's a nice new feature uh, that really was existed in Validator before this, but now you can do the same in Chimera. So we'll take a pause there. Duncan, any questions about uh, single beam and template DB files? No, everyone seems, uh, seems happy at the moment. OK. Uh, so I think just have a quick peek at Chimera Live. It seems to be still be going. And I just know for a fact that there's 20 lines in that. So over the course of the webinar so far, we started off with one file. We left this unattended. And this imported every line. It computed all the georeferencing and ray tracing. Uh, it computed the TPU, and it added it to a dynamic surface. So if this was a real survey, this, this data actually took about two and a half to three hours to collect. You'd set this up alongside. And you can do this with Quincy DB files, Kongsberg.all files, Reson S7K, HiPack, HSX, anything you like that we support. You can bring it through Chimera Live. You can customize the vessel template and have it stop over any of the vessel offsets or patch test offsets or TPU parameters that are automatically figured out for you. You can stop over those and have it processed and added to a dynamic surface so that when this last ping is, is pung, I guess is a word, uh, you stop your acquisition and your Chimera Live project is just one file behind. And you let it catch up. And if you had it automatically copying the raw files into your directory, which I'll show right now, Control F opens my project. And if I look in sources, my project has all of that raw data within that one project. And if I come up here, so how much does that weigh in at, you know, 1.4 gigabytes? I tear down Chimera Live. So I come over here, I, I click this button, 
It's as easy as that. You click one button to start it, you click one button to stop it. There's no processing configuration. We do most of the processing you need without asking you about it. And this project is ready to go home and work on. And when you get in the office, you won't have any surprises. So that's some of the nice, nice interesting parts about coming alive and how that can change life for you in a near real time or a just in time environment offshore. So I'll jump to the last uh, part of the demo, which is looking at the support of the Kongsberg NavLab format. So earlier this year, you might have seen in LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever social media you subscribe to that uh, Duncan and John Hughes Clark and Craig Wallace and a few other people were out hunting for the Loch Ness monster uh, in Loch Ness. Uh, when was that, Duncan? It was uh, uh, April, April, April um, uh, earlier on this year. April. Yeah. So we've got the data from that, some of it anyway, not the data with the Loch Ness monster. But we've got some of the uh, AUV data. This was a Munin system running with an EM2040M uh, deployed on it. So what I'll do is I'll bring that in and I'll just point out what does an AUV data set look like in Chimera? How can you tell it's AUV data? So I'll select a line, I'll go to the vessel editor, and the very first entry in the system is the vessel type and it says AUV. So we've detected that it's a subsurface platform and we detect that because Oh, it's telling me that you're processing things. Don't change your vessel file. That makes sense. Uh, it detects it because if I go to the time series editor and I go to the leftmost uh, combo box and click on that, you'll see there's something platform depth. So there's the depth signal that comes in that .all file for vertical referencing. So we start the mission on this one line at about uh, 66 meters deep and going down to about 150 meters over the span of that one line. And so let's just grid that up and see what it looks like. So in real time, the, the acquisition system on the subsurface platform was aware of its depth and was able to apply it. And we'll just make a quick grid. And what's also nice is when you have a platform depth and you switch into 3D mode, you can see the actual depth your track line is drawn in 3D, so you can actually see your, your obstacle avoidance algorithm at work. How well is your mission planning software dealing with going around corners and dealing with changes in height? So that's a nice QA, is that you get a sense right there in 3D. Oh wow, yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's doing a constant altitude off the seafloor. It seems to be responding to changes in topography as I expect. So if you do a lot of AUV type work, that's a really nice way to just quickly check that things make sense. It's in 3D. So this is the real-time product. So there's some new capability I'll show that helps me tell this story about NavLab. If I click the dynamic surface, there's a, a thing that we've renamed under the dynamic surface menu. Snapshot is a static surface. I want to take a static snapshot of this because I'm going to do some math and get a different result. And the dynamic surface by its very nature will update in front of me. So I kind of want a before and an after picture. So I snapshot as a static surface and I'll just expand this dialog a bit so you can see what I'm typing. I'm going to give it a name before. Uh, I want the entire surface. I want the mean depth, not the shallow or deep layers. I don't want anything to color it by, just color it by depth. And it does that and it sticks it into the static surfaces area. So it looks pretty much the same as the dynamic surface. I'll just tuck that away for future use. And then the new thing that we've added that uh, some of our clients at Oceaneering had asked for, and actually eTrack as well, uh, in the dynamic surface, I want to be able to extract a property layer. If I go to the dynamic surface depth layer menu, there's average, deep, and shallow that I can look at, and then there's all these different layers. Standard deviation, for example, I can color by that, or sounding density. Sometimes you need to demonstrate to your client that you've got a certain number of hits per square meter, uh, so how, or you've maintained a certain standard deviation. So how do you get that data out to look at, first of all, and then deliver it to a client. So there's new capability now. Under the dynamic surface menu, you go to the extract property layer option and you say, I'm going to expand the dialog so you can see what I'm typing. I'm going to call this standard deviation before. And I want the entire surface and you can extract either the bin count or the standard deviation. We'll stick with standard deviation and click OK. And this extracts a flat image. If I just go to 3D mode, you'll see, of course, the terrain model is drawn in 3D. The flat image is drawn at the zero level, and that's a standard deviation. 
file and let's just adjust the color map to be 0 to 0.5. And this is showing you that for these the areas of overlap, the standard deviation is high because the navigation in real time wasn't that great. And I can profile that surface and I can see it's normally about 0.1, but when the areas of overlap, it's at about half a meter in this particular area here. So that's set aside. I'm going to turn that off for visualization. And now let's bring in the nav lab data, which is going to bring a benefit because apparently there were some problems with the HIPAP in real time. It wasn't uh, working as well as it should have. Uh, so they did some post-processing and brought the nav lab data in. So now you can bring that in. So under the source menu, nav lab files are binary. So you go to the add binary navigation files. And now this will pay attention to .bin files. And there it is, navlabsmooth.bin. I click OK. And this is the usual import experience if you're bringing in POSMV000 files or if you're bringing in SBET files or the Novotel SBTC files. It's the same experience. What systems do you want to bring in? And you have to make a brand new system for each one so that you can tell them apart from the ones that came in from your original multibeam files. So I'll call this nav lab position. So I'm making a new system in my vessel configuration. And for that, I want to bring in the position. Uh, for the motion system, I want to nav lab motion. And I click OK. And if I want, I can change some of these system configurations if I know what to type. I'll leave them at zero. So for the motion time series, I want to bring in motion and I'd like to bring in heading also. And then most importantly, I want that post-process smooth depth. I'm going to use the Doppler velocity log and the inertial sensors and the GPS fixes to give us a nice blended smooth position. Nav lab depth, I'll call it that. Bring in the depth, please. And I click OK. So Chimera is going to chew that up and figure out what's going on in there, and it'll display it in the scene for us. And the NavLab file covers the whole mission. So you'll see that if I zoom out, that's the entire day's mission. And really, we just care about the bits that overlap in time with our multi-beam files. So now that I can see the NavLab lands in there, I don't need to plot it anymore. Uh, Chimera was smart enough to realize that the NavLab file lined up with all of the multi-beam files and says, hey, you need to reprocess these. So I'll click OK. So it'll quickly chew through those. It's going to do a full re-ray trace because we have a new depth solution. So that's going to park the multi-beam head at a different spot in the water column. And you want to ray trace from that correct spot. And let's look down here. You can see the areas where it was a little crunchy and the overlap between different passes. This should clear up once the reprocessing is done. And you'll see that the navigation track lines are being adjusted as each file gets done to their new position. The grid updates. And then what I'll do, uh, just when that's done, and that got whoa, a whole lot smoother. Zoom the bounds. So the area got smoother, and this is why I made the before image. So what I'll do is I'll do that same trick again. I'll click the dynamic surface, go to the dynamic surface menu, and snapshot as a static surface. I want to call this one after. I click OK. And that gets put in the static surfaces area. And what I'll do is select the two of them and then use my favorite mode in Chimera other than Control F. The flicker mode, so use the tilde key, and it changes the visibility. And if you're a Quincy user in the 815 release, this capability has brought, been brought into Processing Manager too. So you select your surfaces you want to see and you can flick between them. So you can see the before where there's a lot of disagreement, the overlap between lines, and after that smooths up really nice. So that is, that's exactly what we wanted to see with that post-process solution. And let's finish the story. I'll click the dynamic surface again, go to the menu, and then the new, the new capability that clients have asked for is extracting the property layers. I want the standard deviation, so that's pre-selected. And I want standard deviation after. Hit OK. And that gets added. And I'm going to stretch the color map as well to 0 to 0 0.5. And what we'll expect to see is if I turn off all these other things, and I select these two, and I go to flicker mode again with the tilde key, that sure enough, the agreement is much better. The big bad standard deviations that were unacceptable before are palatable now and pretty close to what we were able to achieve on a single pass. Of course, that's not the rule globally for the whole data set. Some areas got a little bit worse, for example, here. But for the most part, 
the bad areas got much, much better. And that's it for NavLab. And that just works now. So if you've got Hugh and Munin or if you use any of the Kongsberg subsea solutions and you use NavLab, that just works now in Chimera. Same experience as with, it is with SBETs and POSMB files, et cetera. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, that's pretty much the end of the demo. Maybe uh, if we have any questions, Duncan? Um, not, not really. Just um, what you know, we have to create the uh, different sensors for the different uh, from the one file. Uh, and I was just explaining that the uh, you, know, you might not want to uh, import the motion sensor data again because that requires a full refraction where you might only just want to update the position and the depth or even just the depth. Exactly. So that's why you've got the different sensors. Yeah, maybe I can walk through that again. I'll, I'll remove this file from the project and re-import it. And that way we'll just get to that dialogue again. You don't have to bring all of these in. If I only wanted the depth because I felt that was the thing that was really holding me back, I could just bring in the depth and leave the position, I mean, if you look at the standard deviation maps, it was a, a position misalignment that was our biggest problem. But if you only wanted the depth, you could bring that in. Uh, for the motion, if you only wanted motion but not heading, you could do that. So you can bring everything in if you like, or just the one thing that you actually need. Does that answer the question? Maybe if the person has time to say yes, no, we can follow up on that immediately. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just quickly spin through the release notes to show off some of the screen grabs of the things that we didn't have time for here. This is in the handout uh, that you've got. It's in the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, the vessel configuration stuff, there's a new button in the vessel editor that lets you save things once you update all of your system parameters. Uh, the next time you bring data into your project manually, that's now available here. If you want to set this up and keep it for all of your surveys for the future, you can take those files and park them somewhere on your disk. In which case, if you start a new project, you click on this button to navigate to those master configuration files and you can bring them in. And there's a lot of protections in place to keep you from, example, applying a, a Resan S7K configuration to a HiPAC HSX file, for example. We, we check the make model serial number to stop you from making those kinds of mistakes because you know, when you're tired and you're offshore, these things happen. So we put protections in place for that. And you've already seen in Chimera how you can specify that same vessel template override here. Um, Takari, we talked about that. Single beam, we talked about that. Um, NavLab, we talked about that. There's some new options in the cube configuration. If you're making a dynamic surface, there's a new advanced button. And this is uh, Dr. Brian Calder had wanted to help us figure out a couple of small problems we were having and he wanted access to some of the finer grain parameters that most people don't need to play with at all. So we've exposed these here. If you're an advanced user or power user, you can click that button and you'll get these extra settings and you can type them in and see what they do. If you don't know what they mean or if you're happy with the way it works out of the box, you just never click this. But it's there if you need it. Uh, SVP editor, there's a new little bit of a tweak here. Uh, you can now specify the depth bias of your SVPs profiler's depth sensor and you can specify a sound speed bias. So for example, if you collected a whole bunch of data and you found after the fact that your CTD was under-reporting the sound speed by 3.6 meters per second or over-reporting it, you can fix that in here and that gets applied during the ray tracing. So before that you would have had to type that in manually to each one or go figure that out in another application and re-import it. So now you can easily capture that bias which is good for uh, data auditing and you can keep that separate from the actual raw observations. Uh, the dynamic surface improvements, there's a new option in the dynamic surface menu that lets you launch a bin information widget. I can show that real quick since we have a minute left. I select my surface. Under the dynamic surface menu, there's a bin info. Uh, I think if you're a Quincy user, you're probably used to the word cell. Uh, bin information is more of a flatter mouse word that we've got in Chimera. So as you move over the surface, you'll see all of the layers of the dynamic surface are reporting their values to you. And if you had cube running, for example, it would also tell you the number of hypotheses, the uncertainty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you have just a regular dynamic surface, they're just not listed at all. So if you have a standard deviation, the sounding density, 
and all that stuff. So you can get at that if you need to. Uh, and that was uh, re uh, requested by a number of Quincy users. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it, yeah. Yeah, there's just one question was, is the link to this webinar recording for replay? And uh, yes, the, the, the webinar is going to be uploaded to our QPS YouTube channel. Um, it is being recorded, so uh, you'll be able to uh, download it as soon as it's up, which will be hopefully tonight. Perfect. So I'll pop my face back in and say goodbye. And thanks for coming. And uh, if you have any questions, get in touch with us. We're more than happy to answer them. Uh, if you have some technical uh, questions or you want to see if this works for you, you know, that's, that's part of our job is to help you figure that out. So don't be shy. Uh, go to the website. You can get the, web, uh, the uh, evaluation version. You can contact sales at QPSNL or support at QPS.NL uh, for further questions. And uh, we'll sign off. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time.